Hello, everyone, and welcome to the program. Today, I have the great pleasure of interviewing my good friend, Dr. Leo Galland. Uh, many of you know about Dr. Galland, know of his work. He's uh, internationally recognized as a leader in integrated medicine. Uh, he's an award-winning clinician who is regularly chosen for America's Top Doctors. Uh, he's the author of three highly acclaimed uh, popular health books, The Fat Resistance Diet, which we're going to talk about today, Power Healing and Super Immunity for Kids. Uh, Dr. Gallon is a board-certified internist, and he's also a fellow of the American College of Nutrition. Uh, he's the founder of PillAdvised.com and author of the weekly Pill Advised newsletter on that website that really highlights research on medications and their interactions with supplements, uh, how um, um, medications can interact with each other. Very, very good resource. In addition, uh, Dr. Gallen is the director of the Foundation for Integrated Medicine, uh, which is a nonprofit organization committed to integrating nutritional therapies into the clinical arena, into the clinical practice. Dr. Gallen received his education at Harvard University and uh, the New York University School of Medicine, and then trained in internal medicine at the NYU Bellevue Medical Center. Uh, he has held faculty positions at a number of institutions, in, including NYU, Rockefeller University, the State University of New York, and the University of Connecticut. So I'm really looking forward to our interview today, and we're going to be focused on uh, Dr. Gallen's book, The Fat Resistance Diet, uh, really some incredible information uh, that he's bringing to us on this whole issue with why people uh, gain weight and have so much trouble losing weight. So let's jump right into our interview. Well, hello, Dr. Gallon, and thanks for being here today. David, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. What uh, In the intro, we talked about your, your wonderful book, The Fat Resistance Diet, and I want to just jump right into it if we can. And you know, early on in your book, you jump into some uh, biochemistry that uh, may seem to some people to be a little bit compelling, talking about things like insulin and things like leptin. But I think the importance uh, of that discussion really had to do with what regulates our appetite, and especially as it relates to leptin. So why don't we start with a brief overview of appetite and those uh, things that influence appetite, and then we'll talk about how we can change that. Well, appetite, of course, is controlled by hormones. Um, many of them are in the brain. Some are actually in the stomach. and um, Leptin is one of those hormones, uh, and it, there's a pretty complicated network of neurologic and hormonal interactions that will impact on different aspects of appetite. What's special and important about leptin is that leptin in the brain suppresses appetite. That's its normal function. In the rest of your body, leptin actually um, speeds metabolism and the breakdown of fat cells. Now, there are other effects that leptin has. Um, higher leptin levels are associated with um, protection against um, certain disorders. Alzheimer's, I think, is one. Um, but it's always it's kind of difficult to know what's the exact relationship because leptin is not a simple hormone. Um, and I'll get into that in a moment, and which is really kind of the theme of, of the fat resistance diet, which is how to use leptin optimally to lose weight and maintain a lean body weight. So in the brain, leptin suppresses appetite. In your tissues, it uh, switches you from storing fat to burning fat makes your muscles burn fat more. It turns on a switch called AMPK, which is really important for uh, metabolism. Um, from an evolutionary perspective, leptin lets us know if we're well fed. Mm -hmm. um, when there's a lot of food around um, and you're starting to make fat, leptin levels go up and they tell you, okay, you know, get out of the scarcity mode. You don't have to eat that much because there's plenty right around the corner. You can exercise more. Um, you can burn fat easily. 
Uh, it says that to your brain. It says that to your body. When there's scarcity and you start losing weight, leptin levels drop, and the opposite signals occur. In fact, leptin is a major control signal for fertility in women. And, and, and I think that really explains its evolutionary role very important, very clearly. When there's a lack of nutrients, women become less fertile because they can't support pregnancy. And leptin is the, leptin is the signal that does that. As, and it's one of the reasons why women who become too thin uh, stop ovulating. So it's really a protective mechanism. They're, the body thinks they're becoming too thin because of lack of caloric resources and says this isn't a good time to have babies. Right, right. That's exactly what happens with it. Now, leptin is made by fat cells. People who have more fat make more leptin. That makes sense. The problem is, and this is a problem that may be unique to our modern society, there are people who develop leptin resistance, which means that the leptin doesn't work. Mm. So the levels keep going up. As they go up, they actually cause inflammation, but the response to leptin is blocked. So it doesn't suppress appetite. It doesn't increase metabolism. It's quite parallel to the phenomenon of insulin resistance that leads to type 2 diabetes. So which the I, I think just to take a step back, I think many of our viewers are at least somewhat familiar with the idea of insulin resistance, that the signal isn't uh, being received appropriately, and so the body then defaults to create more and more insulin to try to bombard that receptor, and as such, we get weight gain and fat deposition. And I, I think what you're saying here with reference to leptin is sort of the same thing's happening, that even though the body's making leptin, uh, its receptor... Uh, uh, channels are not being activated, and therefore it's not doing its job in terms of reducing appetite. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying, David. And there seem to be multiple mechanisms by which that happens. One of the mechanisms, and the one that I focus on, is the role of inflammation in causing leptin resistance. And inflammation is a state in the body that is characterized by a number of chemical changes. It's a, res it's a normal response to injury and infection, but there are many aspects of a modern lifestyle that produce a chronic low-grade state of inflammation, which has disastrous metabolic consequences. And leptin resistance is one effect of chronic inflammation. Now, the chronic, and this creates a vicious cycle because the, by blocking the effects of leptin and actually blocking the effects of insulin as well, uh, inflammation contributes to weight gain. The more weight you gain, the greater your tendency to have inflammation in your body. And, and I think that is one of the reasons why so many people are unable to lose weight. This is uh, really very incredible because uh, it's the same insulin, uh, same inflammation mechanism that relates to insulin uh, sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So that uh, I think that you really zeroed in on a key player here, and that is, dare I say, the fundamental role of inflammation in obesity. And then uh, moving forward, how this may create a feed forward cycle, no pun intended, whereby this uh, obesity in and of itself actually further enhances the cascade of inflammation. Uh, right. Absolutely. That, that is what's happening. And so in the fat resistance diet, I approach the issue of inflammation from the perspective of foods that either contribute to or protect against inflammation. And so with my son, Jonathan, uh, who did all of the recipes, I created, uh, we created a diet that was based on proven anti-inflammatory foods, um, foods that when consumed, decrease the level of inflammation in the body and eliminating those foods 
which when consumed increase the level of inflammation. Well, I want to be specific about that a little bit later on when you can talk about uh, maybe some recipes, but but what are the broad strokes in terms of the major macronutrients, for example, fat, carbohydrate, uh, protein, and perhaps some of the micronutrients? What are the broad strokes that tend to tamp down inflammation and therefore limit this cascade? Well, within each category, uh, it's, uh, it's not carbs per se, um, uh, fat per se. Protein is, is in a diff somewhat different category. Um, you never eat pure, you almost never eat pure protein unless you're on a diet of egg whites, uh, or skim milk or a supplement. And, yeah. Or a supplement. Um, and people vary greatly in their protein requirements, uh, um, among individuals. Um, when it comes to carbohydrates and fat, there are two principles that have been, that have really been proven over and over again in scientific studies. For carbs, it's glycemic index. It's the, the tendency of carbohydrates to raise blood sugar. And that the higher the glycemic index or the glycemic load in the diet, which is the cumulative glycemic index of the foods that you're eating, the greater the inflammation-provoking potential of those foods are. I, I want to stop you right there because that was really a very, very important point that correlates the glycemic index, how much of food is going to raise your blood sugar and over a period of time, uh, over what length of time it remains elevated, to the process of inflammation, which then hampers your body's ability to know when you're full. So what you're saying then is the higher the glycemic index of your food, the less ability you will know that it's time to stop eating. Uh, right. That's true in the short run and also in the long run. And I would say that inflammation is one of the most important mechanisms through which a high glycemic index diet is harmful. When it comes to fat, there are fats that are anti-inflammatory and fats that are pro-inflammatory and other fats that are neutral. The Fats with the greatest anti-inflammatory potential are the omega-3 uh, essential fats, which are found in fish oils and in certain vegetable oils, um, flax and chia and, um, and hemp oil. But by or, and large, the these seed. are not the oils that are used in the commercial preparation of food, nor what you generally find in the grocery store. What are we getting there? Well, there, most of the vegetable oils are rich in omega-6 fat, fatty acids. And omega-6 fatty acids are very tricky. They may have, um, they tend to promote inflammation and cancer when consumed in large numbers. Um, they also, they may, there are certain omega-6 fats that may have an anti-inflammatory effect. So what's probably most important is getting the balance right between omega-6s and omega-3s. What happened during the 20th century was a pretty dramatic increase in consumption of omega-6 fats from uh, vegetable oils. Uh, then there are the, so the omega-6 and the omega-3 category apply to what are called polyunsaturates, polyunsaturated fatty acids. The, there are other oils that are based on monounsaturated fatty acids that uh, in which the fatty acid itself is not is kind of neutral on the um, battlefield of inflammation uh, olive oil would be one example but um, if you if you compare let's say extra virgin olive oil with ordinary olive oil there's a huge difference which is not due to the oil itself it's due to the components of the olive that are still present. Um, and, and I'll just, there's one interesting example. If you fry food in regular olive oil, you will produce harmful products that damage DNA. And that's true for frying food in, you know, almost any unsaturated oil. However, if you use extra virgin olive oil, it's so rich in antioxidants that that DNA does, damage does not occur. 
So it sort of offsets the damaging effects. Yes, it, it offsets it. Process. What about saturated fats? I mean, that's certainly a hot button. Uh, we've heard some uh, a bit of an about face now in terms of governmental bodies uh, that are advising uh, us in Washington what we should and shouldn't be eating. Well, you know, saturated fats um, may or may not provoke inflammation. Uh, the, the most inflammatory fats, I'll get back to the saturated mm -hmm. ones, are the trans fatty acids, um, especially those that are produced by the partial hydrogenation of vegetable oils. And um, I mean, 30 years ago, in the first book that I wrote, Super Immunity for Kids, I warned parents about the dangers of feeding their kids foods that contained trans fats and that were rich in, you know, that were made with partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. And at the time, there were groups, including some responsible groups in the nutrition community who have changed their mind about this, who said, no, there's no evidence. There's not enough evidence to support that. Of course, margarine is really rich in, the, in trans fats. Uh, subsequently, Walter Willett and his colleagues at Harvard demonstrated that when looking at uh, inflammation in the body, trans fats, uh, they actually found an, an inflammatory effect of saturated fat in general, but it paled in comparison with the inflammation-provoking effect of trans fats. And yet that's what we were told we should, uh, we should use. We should yeah. never eat butter, we were told. Right. In favor of margarine. I remember the, right. the chiffon margarine commercial. It's not nice to fool Mother Nature. <laughs> yes, right. And, and actually, you know, some interesting studies. Um, one of my areas of interest outside of weight um, and allergy, which is the focus of my next book, ha, um, has been inflammatory bowel disease, uh, col ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and other gut problems. And there are data from Europe looking at people's diets and then following them prospectively to see who develops inflammatory bowel disease. And a high intake of omega-6 oils is a significant risk factor for the development of inflammatory bowel disease. High consumption of margarine is one of the greatest risk factors for the development of inflammatory bowel disease. I mean, it can, if you're a frequent margarine user, it raises your risk by about 27 fold. Wow. I mean, which is huge. Um, so these oils are highly inflammatory. They're very undesirable in the diet. Uh, and so what we did in the fat resistance diet was to try and balance the consumption, the, the levels of different, of fat in the diet so that there was a ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s of polyunsaturates to saturates, um, virtually no trans fats that would be most likely to combat inflammation. And we also made it low on the glycemic. Uh, this, these were all low glycemic index carbs uh, that were chosen for the weight loss stages. And I think, you know, a, a very good point I'd love our viewers just to really embrace, and that is that uh, it, it's not a question of a high fat versus a low fat diet as much as it is a question of what type of fat you are consuming. Similarly, you know, when we, we see reports that eating meat is a bad thing associated with colon cancer or, or other issues, I think it's really important for people to understand that it's Again, a question of the type of meat, whether it is meat that has been raised in such a way, fed grains that are also uh, going to raise the omega-6 pro-inflammatory uh, content of the very food that you consume, uh, cattle that have been given antibiotics and who knows what else, versus higher omega-3 containing meat like you'd find in grass-fed uh, choices. So again, you know, the notion of fat is good or fat is bad, I think I'm so glad that you're able to, to put that into context for us. Similarly, um, there are people who believe that across the board, carbohydrates should be avoided at all costs. And I think you did a really wonderful job in characterizing uh, carbohydrates, not just in terms of glycemic index, but also in looking at fiber. Where do we go with this information? Right. Well, fiber is really important and is anti-inflammatory. And 
uh, of course, and you're, if you're going to be eating high fiber foods, you're going to be getting carbs. And so we talk about, uh, I mean, the, the fat resistance diet is a high fiber diet. They'll supply 30 to 40 grams of fiber from food every day. Um, the average American is, you know, getting half that amount. And that not only has a negative effect on the bacteria living in the gut, which is something I'd love to talk about, um, but, um, but it also, low fiber diets are pro-inflammatory. High fiber diets are anti-inflammatory. And um, there are numerous sources of dietary fiber and there are different types of fiber. The, uh, depending on how soluble it is or how insoluble. Um, I think a mixture of fiber from natural food sources is the best way to get fiber in your diet because those high fiber uh, vegetables um, and other plant-based foods are also going to be rich in nutrients and in nutrients that you're not going to get from supplements. Uh, that, yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, you, you, you correlate then levels of inflammation in response to consumption of dietary fiber. Who knew? Uh, you know, interesting report that recently came out showing uh, as an interventional trial, reducing symptoms of asthma in children by doing nothing more than giving them fiber. And I think that, you know, really drives home the point that it's a systemic response to a dietary challenge uh, that in this case was very positive. So what do you suppose is going on that, that relates dietary fiber to reducing or lack thereof increasing inflammation? Well, by definition, fiber is not digested in your own gastrointestinal tract. It's not absorbed. It's, it is basically food for the bacteria that live in your colon. And those bacteria will ferment it to produce different kinds of substances, uh, short chain fatty acids are among them and short chain fatty acids do turn off inflammatory signals in the body they are absorbed that is if you eat high fiber foods there will be a change in the level of short chain fatty acids in your colon they're absorbed they're very well absorbed these are volatile they're like gases um odorless gases and they there are mechanisms in your body, there are that control the activity of cells and that control inflammation that actually get turned off by those short chain fatty acids. Well, the, beyond that, of course, the role uh, you've talked about quite a bit uh, of leaky gut, of gut permeability as they relate to the health of the microbiome, the gut bacteria, and uh, the short chain fatty acids. You know, I, I, just for our uh, viewers, uh, everybody's talking these days about leaky gut and its role uh, in, in illness. And I, I want to say that uh, Dr. Leo Gallen has been teaching us this information for a couple of decades. Uh, this wasn't news to you. I mean, uh, you, you've you been talking about this for a long, long time. Well, I actually started um, doing um, research and on uh, intestinal bacteria and, micro and, and gut microbes over 30 years ago. And um, and then started looking at the relationship between these and the permeability of the intestine, the toxins that they produce, and uh, systemic uh, effects of those. Yeah, probably close to close to thirty years ago. Published it's, something it's on it. I mean, you were so ahead of your time. I mean, this is now a front and center. Uh, in peer-reviewed journals and even in social media, everyone's talking about leaky gut, and now even. Uh, leaky brain, per, uh, permeability of the right. brain barrier. And uh, people need to understand that you were talking about this decades ago. So for some of those involved in functional medicine, this isn't exactly news. So there are a lot of diets out there. And uh, we hear good and bad things about various popular diets, whether it's Mediterranean or, or paleo. Uh, what makes the fat resistance diet kind of unique and have as much traction as you seem to be getting with it? Well, it, it focuses on the phenomenon of, of inflammation. Uh, it is, um, it's not a total paleo diet. There are grains that are permitted in, the later, in, 
in the later stages, although it basically starts out pretty close to paleo. We do use, for people who are not sensitive to dairy products, we, we do use dairy for a variety of reasons. Um, you can get some, I mean, it's a great addition to certain kinds of meals. There no, you're not drinking milk, um, but it's, it has, it has many uses for people who are not dairy sensitive. And, the, oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. And, um, the Mediterranean diet, I was going to say, you know, there are many different kinds of Mediterranean diets. Uh, the, the Greek, the diet that's eaten on Crete is pretty different from the diet that's eaten in the south of France. Um, there's certain commonalities, but probably more differences than commonalities. There are characteristics of the fat resistance diet that are similar to Mediterranean diets. But, uh, and in general, in the weight loss stages, it's about 30% protein. Mm -hmm. um, so it's compared to the average American diet, it's a relatively high protein diet. Yes. And 30% of, of total daily calories from protein. Oh, from protein, so What might yeah. that look like in terms of a, a person's consumption of various foods during the course of a day? Um, well, you're, you're getting, um, you're getting a, a fair amount of um, poultry or fish. We use fish a lot in the, in the fat resistance diet. Uh, or... Um, Low fat dairy products um, or eggs and egg whites. After all we learned about eggs, and we were told over the years how horrible eggs are, and now we're seeing them being welcomed back to the to the dinner table or the well, breakfast well, table, as it were. The other um, later on in the book, the other uh, important pillar, uh, which actually dates back to uh, your earlier work um, of the program, is exercise. How does that influence inflammation? Uh, Aerobic exercise of moderate intensity is anti-inflammatory. That's been shown. Now, if you run a marathon, you're going to be in a pretty heightened state of inflammation after the marathon. But, you know, there's some really interesting studies done looking at the, the usual exercise expenditure of, of um, prehistoric humans or humans living uh, under similar conditions. And they're not marathon runners, uh, and they're not weightlifters. They engage in moderate intensity exercise for several, you know, for several hours each day, well within the reach of ordinary uh, urban dwellers today. I think that's a very interesting point because uh, we have this notion that hunter gatherers were always hunting and gathering, but when you are utilizing high uh, caloric density foods in the form of fat, for example, twice the caloric density in comparison to carbohydrate, um, you don't have to have as much food to still maintain your caloric uh, needs. And you know, there, there's some discussion that, in fact, we became tied to the land and tied to this notion of labor uh, once we developed agriculture. So. Uh, you know, it, it requires that you work the earth from, from dawn to dusk as opposed to being able to have access to foods that have fat in them that'll give you the calories that you need. Um, people, let me just say, David, people, st you know, people who have studied Stone Age cultures, fine. They have a lot of leisure time. I mean, they, well, after all, they, how did they invent? They invented culture. They had a lot of time to hang around and chat with their friends and chew the fat and relax, <laughs> chew the fat. Right? Um, yeah, it, agriculture made people work much harder. That's a really good point. Um, I'd like to uh, close by just uh, having you talk about your really incredible website, Pill Advised. Uh, tell us why you did that and what you've been able to accomplish, and what is the mission? Well, Pill Advised started out as a way to bring to everybody software that I had been working on for a couple of years that looked at the interactions between drugs and supplements, drugs and food, and supplements and food. And I, I extensively reviewed what had been published, looked at a lot of compendia of information and found they were really lacking, and so created the software. 
And I wanted to make that available because it's my belief that a lot of the benefits of dietary supplementation are as enhancers of drug therapy. Mm -hmm. Or it's possible for a physician who knows the data to use supplements to enhance drugs. You know, all the publicity is on negative drug supplement interactions. There's actually way more data on positive drug su supplement interactions, and it's less anecdotal and more controlled and scientific. And uh, along with Jonathan, your son, uh, you are putting out a newsletter every week. Right. So the site expanded to include a lot of information on nutrition, the environment, and um, functional medicine. Um, my son, Jonathan, who basically runs that site and manages it, is not only very interested in nutrition, he has a particular interest in the environment. Uh, and so that he really expanded what, what Pill Advise's mission was. He and I have now written a book on the environment and nutrition as it impacts on the allergy epidemic that's sweeping the world. Well, that's going to be coming up soon, and I think that uh, we'll definitely want to uh, do another uh, interview like this when the book's available. But uh, can you give us a, a brief uh, preview uh, as to what that's going to be about? What's your focus? Well, you know, there's an epidemic of allergies that is sweeping the world right now. The number of people who are known to have allergic diseases is estimated to be greater than 1 billion. I mean, that's astronomical. In fact, over the past 100 years, allergy has gone from being a kind of quirky and rare phenomenon to the most common category of chronic illness in the world. Wow. That signifies a, just a massive change in people's immune systems. And so what, we're, what we do in that book is to look at the reasons why this has happened, which are environmental and nutritional, and then to give people uh, programs and advice on methods that they can use and start implementing immediately to begin reversing the impact of that epidemic on their own lives. Well, I think you know all of us uh, are will indicate we can't uh, we can't wait for that book to come out, and then and certainly you and I are going to talk about that when it does happen. But I think in the meanwhile, uh, the, the primary principles in the fat resistance diet are really going to be, uh, I would say, pretty applicable to what you're going to be talking about moving forward, and that is that the type of fat matters. Uh, that uh, carbohydrates in the form of fiber-rich foods are really important, those that are nutrient-dense, especially to nurture the, the gut bacteria that play a, a really fundamental role in allergies. So can't wait till we get to take a look at that book. Uh, it was really exciting working on it. I have to you know, whenever I write a book, this one in particular, I learn so much. I start out thinking, well, I really know this field well, so I'm going to write a book about it. And then I start, you know, as I write it, and I start going into the literature, it's, uh, it always amazes me to find out what's actually been discovered but buried somewhere. Often that research comes from other parts of the world. Yeah. It hasn't been done here. And often uh, it's surprising how old it was that, you know, these are things people were talking about decades ago and it never got the light of day. Right, right. I mean, look, that happens in science all the time. Yeah. One, well, listen, yeah. uh, thank you so much for your time. I know you've got to get back to your clinical practice, and uh, it's been a real pleasure, Leo. It's been great talking to you, David. Okay. Wow, that was uh, some great information. I think you'll all agree that uh, there's a lot more to understanding uh, metabolism and what regulates metabolism uh, than we realize, but what uh, Dr. Gallen has really uh, opened our eyes to is the notion that we really do have control over those factors. Again, uh, here's a copy of his book, uh, The Fat Resistance Diet, uh, available obviously everywhere, and uh, Reprogram Your Body to Stay Thin Forever, a terrific book. I'd highly recommend it. And uh, really grateful again to Dr. Gallon for sharing his time with us today. We'll see you soon.